our late great friend, a doctor in the city, uh, Rob Buckman, uh, wrote a book once. And the title of the book um, was a powerful one. It said, cancer is a word, not a sentence. And Rob's point was that there should be some optimism associated with cancer, that it doesn't need to be something that is um, a full sentence or a death sentence. Despite that optimism, hearing that word can be terrifying for cancer patients. There's some new research coming out from the Canadian Cancer Society that is offering a bit of a better outlook. More people are becoming cancer survivors now than ever before. Overall cancer survivor rates have improved to something like 63%. That's up 8 percentage points since the early 90s. And for people with blood cancer, the prognosis is even better. Dr. Aaron Schimmer is an acute leukemia physician and director of research at Princess Margaret Hospital. He's with me in studio now. Good morning. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, That sounds like good news, is it? Well, it is good news. It's big. It's important, obviously, for the patients that we see that we're able to offer better and more effective treatments for them. But it's also important because it shows that the investments that we've been making in cancer research over the last 20 years are now starting to pay dividends in the way of better treatments and better options for our patients. So tell me more about that. Why are more people broadly, and we'll talk about blood cancers in a moment, but if you look at it broadly, why are more people surviving a cancer diagnosis? Well, it's for many reasons, but ultimately it stems from our improved understanding of why is cancer happening, why is it progressing, why does it respond to treatment, and why in some cases does it unfortunately come back. And those investments that we made 20 years ago are now being leveraged into new and better treatments. We're able to target the genetic basis of cancer, not genetic problems you get from parents or passed to kids, but the changes that happen spontaneously. We are now able to harness the immune system to attack cancer as well, and we're able to personalize the treatment better for each individual cancer patient. And for blood cancer, um, you are an acute leukemia physician. What's going on there? So it's been really spectacular and dramatic in the area of acute leukemia. So, you know, if you look back, this was until about two, two and a half years ago, a disease for which really there'd been no new treatments for the last 30 years, not for lack of trying. But in the last two and a half years alone, there have been eight new therapies that have been approved for the treatment of acute leukemia. And as a result, we're able to offer therapy that's better than standard chemotherapy and treatments that actually have less side effects and less toxicity. Tell me more about the research that has been done um, to try and get a better handle on what's going on there. And, and, and you, you talked about the, this is a long story in some ways, and the research takes time to pay off. What's been happening? There? So if you look back to the late 90s, early 2000s, in fact, even then, you know, that was research that was built on things that happened decades even before that. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, people started to look at the genetic basis of cancers. Again, so these mutations, these genetic defects, not things you get from parents or passed to kids, but things that are happening spontaneously in the cancer cells that are driving the formation of cancer. And so we began in the early 2000s to understand that genetic basis of cancer. And that cancer, in fact, is a genetic disease. Mm. And now we've been able to leverage that knowledge and translate that into developing new drugs, new therapies that specifically target those defects in the cancer cells. So we're now able to deliver tailored targeted therapy and therapy that in fact has less toxicity than what you might think of as standard chemotherapy. What does that mean tailored targeted therapy? Because again people think the treatment that you're get, going to get is radiation or it's going to be chemotherapy that's going to come with all of those appalling side effects. And in, unfortunately in many cases we continue to use that mm. but more and more it world-class centers like the Princess Margaret but places around the world we're profiling individuals cancer cells at a molecular and genetic level to understand what are those individual drivers of that cancer and then select from our armamentarium of treatment options that we have now the drugs that specifically target those defects in those cancer cells. Where is the most progress being made? Is it through blood cancers? You, you know, certainly if you look at the, uh, the report from the Canadian Cancer Society, uh, overall, uh, solid tumors, as we call them, mm-hmm. if survival has increased in the last five years by about 8%. But in blood cancers, it's actually been close to 20%. And so we're seeing huge gains in that field. If you were speaking with a patient, um, go back to where I started. I mean, there are few words in the English language that scare people more than cancer. Um, how do they receive information like this? How do they receive uh, a report like this? Well, you know, so, so when you're in clinic with an individual patient, I, I think that the 20% figure is a more global figure, a big picture figure. I'm not sure it's very meaningful for that individual patient in the clinic. Yes, of course, they're very excited, but really what, what do they want to know is what treatment should you be offering me? What are my 
chances of responding to this treatment. And there, you know, the 20% is not as relevant for them. But what we can say to them is that we've got new treatments now that weren't even available just a few years ago. And in some cases, what we're looking at are response rates in the area of 70 to 90% for even some forms of acute leukemia. And we can achieve that with far less toxicity than we, w- we were uh, delivering even just a few years ago. Does that reduce the terror then that people experience when they hear that word, when, when the doctor across the table or, or however that conversation happens um, tells them the, their diagnosis? I, I think there's still the terror. I mean, I, I don't think anyone wants to be in Princess Margaret. I think, though, I'd like to think that if they have to be there, at least they know they're in a good place. And I think it provides some comfort and some reassurance to know that we do have treatment, we do have options, and we are going to try to cure this in many cases. What's the moonshot um, in the work that you do? So so we've got a couple moonshots that we've developed at Princess Margaret. Now, some people say they should be called Mars shots because, after all, we've already been to the moon. But, you know, they focus really on two broad things. It's the early detection, prevention, and treatment of cancers, both prior to the earlier, prior to the initial diagnosis, but also that prevention in cases where uh, cancer may destined to be com- coming back. And the other big moonshot is around developing new therapies for those very hard-to-treat cancers, those aggressive metastatic drug-resistant cancers. Are we getting to the point, you see this in some blood cancers, um, which are actually chronic, that, that, that we, we could look at some forms of cancer as a chronic illness? So looking at blood cancers, in fact, you can divide them into acute blood cancers and chronic leukemias, chronic representing more of a grumbling, slower growing, but it actually also reflects the maturation of the cells. A chronic leukemia is, in fact, ones that arise from cells that are more mature, whereas an acute leukemia comes on more suddenly, and that reflects a cell that's less mature, a more immature leukemia cell. Is there the way, are we getting to the point in, in the treatment, and maybe this is the kind of moonshot uh, or Mars shot talk as well, um, where other cancers could be looked at through that chronic lens? Ah, yes. And so while we classify leukemias that way, what you're alluding to is correct, that we can begin in many cases to think about cancer becoming a chronic disease. Mm. Of course, our goal is to cure it. That's, that's our optimal strategy. But if you can control this for long and extended periods of time with low side effect profiles, that's also a victory. Just finally, um, we talk a lot about the, and to your point, the hospitals that are available for treatment. And you don't want to be in those hospitals, but we feel fortunate to live in a city where uh, those treatment options are available. But there's also incredible research that happens in the city and how much of uh, of what we're talking about now is a celebration of of what happens in those towers and the research that goes on outside of the immediate treatment facilities. Absolutely. I mean, we were fortunate, as you said, that Princess Margaret is a world-class hospital. It's also one of the world's top five cancer research institutes. And we've got over 300 world-class physicians and scientists engaged in laboratory and clinical research right now. And it's that research that was done to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that's paying dividends today. And the research being done today, that's what's going to be paying off in five to 10 years now because the horizon looks really very optimistic and exciting for blood cancer. Aaron, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Aaron Schimmer is an acute leukemia physician director as well at the Princess Margaret Hospital, uh, director of research at the Princess Margaret Hospital. You can read more about um, the payoffs of that research and the report uh, from the Canadian Cancer Society at cbcnews.ca.